Welcome to the Stonebridge Community Church online worship service. Today you'll hear the Word of God read, the message from this weekend's in-person service, and two songs to guide you in worship. Thanks for joining us today. Last few weeks and for the next few weeks, we've been going through this sermon series called The Rise and Fall of King David, looking at the rise and fall of King David. And today, we're going to be looking at the fall part, which is also fall weather, the wind. Look at that, God's timing, right? Um, we've been looking at David's rise, and then last week we looked at the promise to David, where David tries to build a temple for God, and God says, who are you to do that for me? And now we're going to look at the fall of David, as I said. I just want to warn you that what that means is we got to look at some uncomfortable stuff, stuff that is easier to ignore, but that is central to David's story and to the story of Israel and Judah, God's people. And if you ignore it, you're ignoring the story of how God was working. So today I'm going to be reading from 2 Samuel chapter 11, and this is the uncomfortable stuff, so I just want to prepare you for that. But 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 through 17. And it happened at the turn of the year, at the time the kings sally forth, that David sent out Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. And David was sitting in Jerusalem. And it happened at eventide that David arose from his bed and walked about on the roof of the king's house. And he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired after the woman. And the one he sent said, Why, this is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, wife of Uriah the Hittite. And David sent messengers and fetched her. And she came to him, and he lay with her, she having just cleansed herself of her impurity. And she returned to her house. And the woman became pregnant and sent and told David and said, I am pregnant. And David sent to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah the Hittite to David. And Uriah came to him, came to him and David asked how Joab fared and how the troops fared and how the fighting fared. And David said to Uriah, go down to your house and bathe your feet. And Uriah went out from the king's house and the king's provisions came out after him. And Uriah lay at the entrance to the king's house with all the servants of his master. And he went not down to his house. And they told David, saying, Uriah did not go down to his house. And David said to Uriah, Look, you have come from a journey. Why have you not gone down to your house? And Uriah said to David, The ark in Israel and Judah are sitting in huts. And my master Joab and my master's servants are encamped in the open field. And shall I then come to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? By your life, by your very life, I will not do this thing. And David said to Uriah, stay here today as well, and tomorrow I shall send you off. And Uriah stayed in Jerusalem that day and the next. And David called him, and he ate before him and drank, and David made him drunk. And he went out in the evening to lie in the place where he lay with the servants of his master, but to his house he did not go down. And it happened in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, put Uriah in the face of the fiercest battling and draw back so that he will be struck down and die. And it happened as Joab was keeping watch on the town that he placed Uriah in the place where he knew there were valiant men. And the men of the town sallied forth and did battle with Joab and some of the troops, some of David's servants fell and Uriah the Hittite also died. Please pray with me. Lord, we know that your scriptures can contain words of hope for us. Your scriptures can contain words that sustain our faith. And your scriptures also can contain cautionary tales for us. Help us to heed the warnings in scripture. Help us to know who it is we should lift up as examples, and who it is we should not. Help us to discern the ways in which you work in different people's lives, the ways in which you work because of people and in spite of people. Help us to have clarity 
and help us to cast our eyes on you and you alone at the end of the day, Lord. Speak to us now through this passage. We thank you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So every once in a while, there is a, a Bible passage that I'll, I'll read and I'll study and I get really excited to give the sermon. I really look forward to it and I'm amped up and excited. And I have to tell you, this is not one of those days. This is one of those passages that I wish we could ignore. I think a lot of us wish we could ignore this. And if you feel that tendency that you want to ignore this passage and just gloss it over or just do what a lot of Bible headers say where they say David commits adultery and they summarize it that way when there's so much more to the story than just that, you should know you're not alone. Remember, I told you that David's story is told in two different places, in the book of Samuel and then also in the books of Chronicles. And I just want to read for you how Chronicles handles this story. Chronicles is not a historical book. If you look in the Hebrew Bible, it comes in the same section as the Psalms and Proverbs. It was never really accepted as a book of history. It's meant to lift David up and it leaves out all the bad stuff of David. It sanitizes David. It makes his story nice and neat and easy to understand. So this is how Chronicles handles this story. It says, and it happened at the turn of the year, at the times when the king sallied forth, that Joab led the army force and ravaged the land of the Ammonites. And he came and besieged Rabbah. And David was sitting in Jerusalem. Notice it's pretty much word for word to this point. And then here's how Chronicles tells the story of Bathsheba. And Joab struck Rabbah and destroyed it. That's it. That's all. Nothing to see here, folks. Move along, move along. Nothing happened here. That's how Chronicles handles this story. So it's not just us who might feel uncomfortable and wish that this wasn't part of David's story. But I think the ways that the church has handled this for the last couple of hundred years, or not a couple hundred years, a couple thousand years really, is either to just kind of ignore it and gloss it over, or to try to defend what David did to try to somehow massage it or nuance it or add our own interpretations to the story to defend David's actions here. But I want to say very, very clearly, we do not have to defend David. We don't have to defend David in this story because the story itself does not defend him. The story itself doesn't gloss over things. And when you read this story, it is an indictment against David. I think we gloss over it too quickly. We don't look at the details of it. And in order to actually understand David's story, and not just David's story, but the story of the people of Israel, the story of the people of Judah, in order to understand the context in which Jesus eventually arises, we have to look closely and carefully at this story. Because this is David's fall, and there are consequences to it. So this morning, we are going to look pretty closely at this story and just go through in detail what the Bible is actually telling us and showing us about David in this story. So I'm going to begin here with the very first note that you may just kind of pass over, but right away, the writer of this story gives an indictment against David. We're told that this is the time when kings sally forth, when kings go out to battle. But then we're told David was sitting in Jerusalem. David was sitting in Jerusalem. If you go all the way back to 1 Samuel 8.20, the whole reason that Israel wanted a king was so that the king would go out and battle before them. That was the deal. They wanted to be like the other nations who had a king who would pull them together, who would unite them, who would lead them in battle. And here David is sitting in Jerusalem while his soldiers are out fighting for him. Right away, David is not upholding his end of the deal. And it's not only that, but we're told that it's eventide, evening. It's late in the day, and David is getting out of bed. It's like I was when I was 16 years old sleeping all day. He's living in the lap of luxury here. He's living in the palace. His soldiers are out fighting for him, but here he is relaxing. 
letting them do all the work. Right from the very beginning, this story should have never happened because David should have been out there with his army. That was the deal that he had with Israel. That was why he was anointed to be king. That's why God gave in and let him become king. But he's not there. So right away, it begins with that indictment, that David is no longer serving the people. He is serving himself. What then happens, David is walking around. He's on the roof looking down at everybody else, and he sees a woman bathing, and he sends for her. Notice how quickly he makes his decision. There's no real hesitation. He learns that this is the wife of Uriah. Now in 1 Samuel, or 2 Samuel, where I just read there, we learn she's the wife of Uriah. Elsewhere in the Bible, we learn that Uriah was what was called one of David's mighty men. He was more than just a random soldier. This was somebody David relied on, which is why I think later on in the story, you can see the familiarity between them. There's a deep, deep betrayal here to Uriah also. But David moves forward. And then David commits adultery. Deuteronomy 22.22 22 makes it really, really clear that the penalty for adultery in the land of Israel was death for both parties. So David commits adultery, and in that moment, he is deserving of death. But he's going to do everything he can to escape consequence. He's going to do everything he can to get out of this. When I presented a different reading of the story of David and Goliath to you a few weeks ago, one of the things that I think was actually emphasized that we overlook is that the story of David and Goliath, it's not one of a miraculous victory of an underdog, but it's one of a cunning and canny military strategist who is able to put together a plan. And here, in David and Bathsheba, I think we see the same traits. David puts together a plan. He puts together a cunning plan. He's trying to escape his responsibilities here. This is when that character trait that I presented in David and Goliath, it doesn't serve him well. Because from here on out, David is going to be incredibly deceitful. We learn David fathers a child. He tries to cover that up because he then pulls Uriah back from battle. This soldier is out there fighting David's fight while David's back at the palace, indulging himself with this soldier's wife. And David pulls him back from that fight. And then David deceives Uriah. He doesn't tell him what's going on. He doesn't tell him what's happening. He asks him questions about the battle. He makes it seem like it's two old soldiers talking to each other, catching up, seeing how things are going. The very man that he has already betrayed, he deceives now. Then we're told David made him drunk. Just think about the lengths David is going here to manipulate. Uriah is loyal. Uriah refuses to go and to indulge himself. It's the exact contrast of what David has done. And David tries to make him drunk. David tries to take his loyalty and have Uriah throw it out the window. But Uriah remains faithful. He remains loyal to David. And I have to say, this is heartbreaking stuff. When you place yourself in Uriah's shoes, this is heartbreaking stuff. What does David do next? When Uriah doesn't go along with the ruse, when Uriah doesn't fall into David's plan, when Uriah doesn't give in to David's manipulations, he orders, da he orders Uriah murdered. He says it's time for him to go. And to me, one of the most disturbing parts of this whole story is that David writes this order out on a note, seals it, and hands it to Uriah. Uriah carries his own death sentence. Uriah is the one who delivers his own death warrant to Joab. That is how callous, how selfish David is in this story. This stuff is very difficult stuff. David then gets what he wants. Uriah is killed. But it's not only just that. 
David causes the deaths of other soldiers, we're told. Other servants of Joab. Other husbands. Other brothers. Other sons. Other friends. Other fathers. Lose their lives because David is trying to cover up his own sin. Because David is trying to escape consequence. And then, to top it all off, when the news, this is later on, we didn't see it in this part of the story, but when the news is then delivered to David that Uriah is in fact dead, David tells Joab, let this thing not seem evil in your eyes. It's a note he gives to Joab, basically saying, don't worry about it. This is just what happens in battle. He says something like, the sword strikes down here and it strikes down there. These are just the things that happen, Joab. Don't worry about it. Now, it might feel like I'm piling on David here, but let me just remind you what I just did was read the story. I'm not the one piling on David. The Bible is. These are the details in this story as it is presented. And we know that God does not agree with David's assessment here. David tells Joab, let this thing not seem evil in your eyes. But at the end of chapter 11 here, we're told that the thing that David had done was evil in the eyes of the Lord. The writer makes sure that we understand God is the one who casts judgment on what David does here. David is deluded. David's own selfishness has blinded him to the consequences of his own actions. He's viewing people as his own means, his own ways of fulfilling himself, of making sure he's comfortable. And he's lost the very thing that a king is supposed to do, which was lead the people, secure the people, make sure that they're okay. Instead, his own soldiers are losing their lives because of his cover-up, because of his plot. Now, back in 1 Samuel 8, the prophet Samuel warned Israel about this. Remember, God never wanted a king. This was never part of God's plan. It was a compromise that God made. And in 1 Samuel 8, they were warned that a king is going to take your sons as soldiers. He's going to take your daughters. He's going to take your goods. He's going to take your servants. Take your animals. King is going to take, 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 take. Israel said okay to that because they thought the king would go forth in battle. And now we have a story with a king not going forth in battle and taking, 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 taking. This is what God warned them. And it's not just with David here. There's consequences to this. Like I said, the David and Bathsheba story, this is David's fall. This is where things begin to unravel for his role as king, for his reign as king. There's real consequences to this, not just for him, but for the entire country. The consequences that the prophet Nathan lays out for David are that the sword shall not swerve from David's house. David's descendants are going to experience violence over and over and over again. We also learn that there's going to be civil war for the kingdom. His own house is going to rise up against him. David's house is going to turn against him. In just a few chapters, it's talking about Absalom. One of David's sons launches a revolt against him, sends the whole country into civil war. People lose their lives. And the prophet Nathan connects that to what David has done here. What David did set everything down a certain course. The trust that he betrayed, the the faithlessness here, set the entire country down a certain course. And then one of the saddest consequences here is that the child does not live. The child that David and Bathsheba father here doesn't live. So I think I understand a little bit now why Chronicles just ignores this one. If you're trying to put David in a good light, it's really hard to do that when you take this story at its face value. When you look at it honestly and soberly, I think it becomes pretty clear. They're not trying to present David as a good king here. This is not what a good king does. 
And though David is forgiven for this by God, the consequences still play out. Sometimes our actions, we can be forgiven for them, but there's still going to be consequences to them. So David is not being lifted up as an example here. And I think it's important because too often, we as people, we take other human beings and we try to lift them up into heroes. We take other human beings and we try to make them an example. And then they no longer become a human being. They become a symbol to us. And when a human being becomes a symbol to you, when it becomes an avatar of a cause that you're supporting, you have to defend that symbol. And you end up having to defend things like David's behavior here. I think for a lot of people, a lot of Christians, what has happened is somebody like David, David himself, he becomes a symbol. And you start brushing over the difficult things. And you start ignoring the tough things in his story. Or you start trying to defend the indefensible. Look, if you want to look to the story and you want to find people that you could connect with, people you can sympathize with, well, let's start with Bathsheba then, okay? Now, with Bathsheba, with the way people have interpreted Bathsheba in this story, I want to tell you, there's a lot of really bad takes out there. There's a lot of really bad interpretations. I actually found one from 1960. I was looking at some older commentaries here. In 1960, this one commentary I found said this about Bathsheba. We must, however, ask whether Bathsheba did not count on this possibility. One cannot but blame her for bathing in a place where she could be seen. I want to clear this up, okay? Bathsheba bears no responsibility for what David did. 100% this was David. Sometimes people will talk about how Bathsheba was bathing on a rooftop so that David could see her and she wanted to catch his eye. Bathsheba was not on the rooftop. The story never says Bathsheba was on the rooftop. David was on the rooftop looking around at other people's houses. What we're told Bathsheba is doing is her purification rite. She's doing a cleansing that is ordered in the book of Leviticus. Bathsheba is being faithful to the book of Leviticus in this story. David's the one who spots her, who sees her. David is solely responsible for what happens in this story. We don't know if Bathsheba wanted David to see her or not. The Bible doesn't say. It's ambiguous here. But in every other story where there's a woman who does some sort of flirtation in the Bible, the Bible's not ambiguous. The Bible makes it really, really clear. So when you look at this story, the fact that it remains ambiguous, Bathsheba very likely did not want this. And even if she did, it didn't matter because what David wanted, he was going to get because he was king. David is responsible for this story. So if you want to sympathize with someone, sympathize with Bathsheba. Her life is completely changed here. Her husband, who by all accounts seems like a pretty cool guy, a loyal man, a, a faithful soldier, who seems like a pretty good dude, is gone. She loses her husband in this story, and then she becomes part of David's harem. Sometimes we call her Queen Bathsheba, but they didn't really have a queen in this culture at this time. She's just part of David's harem at that point. So sympathize with Bathsheba. If you want somebody to connect with, then maybe connect with Uriah. Because Uriah is loyal throughout this story. Uriah is a victim here of David's selfishness and indulgence. Uriah is the one who is deceived, and yet Uriah will remain faithful. He doesn't give in to selfishness in this story. But I think the safest bet for us is to look at this story and to just acknowledge humans aren't heroes. We are human beings. God never wanted a king. God never wanted somebody to have this amount of power that David has because this is what eventually happens. We human beings, we are not heroes. We are flawed and failing sinners. People who will all fall short. We aren't heroes. And the sooner we acknowledge that, I think the sooner we're able to point to the person who is actually a hero. 
Jesus. There's only one human being that we should lift up as an example. There's only one human being that we should follow. There's only one human being who we should say, be like this person through and through. It's Jesus. What I love the most about reading the Gospels is when you read Jesus' story, you don't have to defend the things he does. They stand on their own. You don't have to ignore certain passages in the Gospels to make Jesus look good. He looks good as he is. You don't have to gloss over his story. You don't have to defend the indefensible when it comes to Jesus. He is the hero. He is the example. And I've said this pretty much every single sermon. He is the king. I know I've ended every single sermon by saying Jesus is king and it can start to feel rote, but I'm going to keep saying it until it really sets in for us. And I want to say, I think a lot of people have used this story from David to say, well, David did worse things than I did and he was forgiven, so I'll be forgiven also. Look, you're going to be forgiven for the things that you did. When we're talking about David, we're not talking about forgiveness. We're talking about lifting somebody up as an example or a hero. You're going to be forgiven for the things you did, but you're not going to be forgiven because David did a bunch of terrible stuff. The only reason that you're forgiven is because Jesus did amazing things. Because Jesus went to the cross. Because Jesus was resurrected. That's where forgiveness lies. Trying to rest your forgiveness in the fact that David did something worse, that's fragile. Our forgiveness rests in Jesus. And when we want to lift up an example, when we want to lift up a hero, it's Jesus. When we want a king, it's Jesus. The sooner we recognize that, the sooner we can stop wasting our time defending the indefensible actions of human beings, and the sooner we can give people a glimpse of the God that we worship, a glimpse of the redemption and forgiveness found in Jesus. He is the king. Please pray with me. Lord, we thank you. You are a God who forgives us. And yes, you forgave David also. But Lord, we know that no human being can serve as a sufficient example for us. You alone are our example. You alone are our hero. You alone are the standard that we try to achieve, that we try to follow. You are the king. You are the one who is on the throne, and you are king in a way David could never have been. Help us to truly understand what that means for our lives.
crown Tell 